everyone. <laughs> I am your primary source here today <laughs> to bear witness to what's happening on the field. Um, I am so blessed to be in this church. I mean, I, I, I met your pastors a few weeks ago and we had lunch together and I was very touched by their gentle leadership. Um, but really to trust this young donkey to take your pulpit, you know, and tell all her, her crazy stories from the field, you know, I, I really um, want to honour the leadership of this house that has embraced me so much. Um, so, just a little short introduction about myself. So, my name is Jemima, but you can call me Jem. And um, like Pastor Monica has said, I am a missionary to East Africa. So, that means Congo, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, those regions. Um, we work primarily with refugees, genocide survivors, and those living in active conflict zones. That means like war zones, right? Um, and I have been doing this for 10 years now, so I'm not as young as I look. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the um, refugees that we work with, um, just a little bit of background about the kind of work, the nature of our work, a lot of them, they they have fled from war. Many of them have endured unimaginable suffering. I mean, we're talking about um, limbs that have been, you know, severed, digits that have been sawn off. Um, they've seen their loved ones die in front of their eyes, and they run with just the clothes on their back. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures um, just so that we can kind of get a visual of that. Um, ask some help from Elvin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. So, so this, this is a typical refugee camp. This is in the Congo. Um, so most of these refugees, they do whatever they can to, you know, gather scraps, um, dry grass, tattered tops and branches and just find a way somehow to erect some sort of a shelter for themselves, you know, after having run for their lives. I'll show you the next picture. This next picture is a bit more recent. Uh, this was just given to me a month ago. Also in the Congo, because fresh war has broken up, out. And um, I was showing this to my five-year-old nephew, and he looked at that, and he looked at the kids sleeping on the floor, and he said, but what, what if it rains? And I thought, yeah, wow, that's a very valid point. What if it rains? You know, so they live in very, very kind of fragile situations. So what we do <clears throat> is we help them to rebuild their lives. And that could look like um, providing necessities like clean drinking water or food security, food rations. Ooh, during the time of COVID, that was a hard season for all of us. Um, I think worldwide it was a hard season, but all the more for refugees because a lot of these refugees, they are daily wage earners. So you imagine a lockdown happens and you cannot go out to earn money. Then what happens? You can't put food on the table. So we were looking at mass starvation and it wasn't just the lockdowns. We were talking about supply chains crumbling because all the nations were trying to hoard food for themselves and so then you find that the borders were closing there was no food going back and forth and so food was so limited and and you realize that a lot of people like my pastor he was in the Congo and he said he went from tent to tent and he would hear stories about mama saying that they took all their savings they went to the shops and realized that their money was nothing you know in, in the face of all these inflated prices that they couldn't even get anything and they just went back to their tent and resigned themselves to die right so my pastor, he was saying that he went from 10 to 10 and he saw that there were kids that were so starved, you know, just so hunger stricken that they, they were just lying on the ground, wasting away. They had no energy to even sit up. Yeah, they were just waiting to die. And when he went and he saw the horror of, of what was happening, he said he even had a mama come up to her and shove the baby into his arms and say, Pastor, please, please take my, my baby or she will die in front of my eyes and my heart cannot bear that. You know, so my poor pastor is like totally like deer in headlights and bamboozled, you know, and, and he and his wife, they're crying out to, to, to us, me and my missionary partner. And she's saying, you know, what can we do? We were asking him, what can we do to, to help? And... And and Pastor said, he said, oh, I think maybe maybe we can ha we can start a feeding program. We start a feeding program for 120 children, a pilot program. We take them in, you know, we limit it to under seven years old, seven years and under. We take them in, um, we feed them, we weigh them in, weigh them out, and we chart their progress. We take in the most malnourished and we try to save them. <clears throat> Sounded like a good plan, right? The first day we started, 
400 children showed up at our doorstep <laughs> because somehow word had got around that if you show up at the missionary's compound, you will get food. So they all came and they were all looking, you know, please, please let us in. The pastor and his wife, they said, come in. <laughs> and so that began our feeding program during the height of COVID. And we were feeding up to 20,000 refugees you know, since the beginning. So we've gone on for almost two years now in all our different fields, but this field in the Congo was a big one. And um, so we started feeding the little kids. I want to show you some pictures about that. Um, I'll show you the next picture about, <clears throat> this was maybe about eight months into the feeding program. We continued feeding. The numbers just grew from 400. To this date, we're feeding 1,400 children, but I'll tell you how it grew. <laughs> anyway, um, the numbers kept growing. And so one day, about eight months into this pro program, my pastor's wife is on the way in with all the food supplies, and she sees this tiny little girl carrying two heavy burdens in front and behind. She would walk, she would stop, she'd put down the burden, and then she'll, you know, gather her strength and lift up the burdens again and walk a few more steps, put it down to rest and just kept going, start, stop, start, stop. So she was trying to see what is going on there. And so when the car grew closer to the compound and to this little girl, Mama saw that this little girl was a tiny little girl, probably not more than the age of seven, carrying one younger sibling in front and one younger sibling behind. And if you can see in this picture, I'm sorry it's not very clear because she was taking it on the move, um, but you see that the eyes of the younger siblings, they are barely conscious, they are so weak, dying of hunger. And when Mama went to talk to, to this little girl, she found out that this little girl had walked from miles away because she had heard that if you go to the missionary's field, you will get food. And so it, our program became a place of hope for these little lives. And so she took her younger siblings and she strapped them in front and behind and walked all the way to this program to save their lives. Ooh, when I saw the courage of this little one, I thought, wow, if she can do it, so can we. I was just talking to Pastor Monica. Sometimes when we're in a, a first world country, we there's a phenomenon called abstraction that kicks in. Abstraction means that if I were to see a little child like that fighting for her life, I would do everything I can in that moment face to face with that child and her suffering to feed her, to ease, to take care of her. But when we're six degrees separated and removed from that place, we will ask questions like, ah, is this sustainable or not? Huh? Huh? This is one and done, you know. You spend so much money on food, then they eat, then why? How? Next month you have to supply some more, is it? You know? <laughs> and I get asked these questions all the time, but it's very different when you're face to face in that space. You're just saving lives. It's, this is just the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God. Yeah. And so, so we started, and I was really, really touched by the love of the children. I think sometimes when you when you're giving um, food rations to adults, um, there, there's such a survival mentality that has already kicked in and solidified over the years. And granted, many of them, they grab because of their children. They're tr they have younger ones, they have dependents that they have to fight for. But when you work with the children, their love is so pure. You know, you see that they are made in the image of God. Like, <clears throat> I'll show you the next picture. <clears throat> This picture is of two young sisters that would carry their handicapped younger sister to the feeding program every week. So we were feeding them two to three times in one week. And every every session they would carry, they would take turns to make the long trek to bring their handicapped sister to the feeding program. And and I was very touched by that kind of sacrificial love, kind of like you know, the story of the ones who took apart the roof and lowered down their handicapped friend, you know. This, this is what these two two sisters are doing. And you'd be surprised, you know, when you're in those places, you see the love and the purity in the hearts of these little ones. Like we have, we had younger kids. At one point in time, our age limit was seven, but we have since increased it. And so the younger kids would come to the food program and they wouldn't eat all their food. They would put the beans and their rice in their pocket and then they would carry it back to their, you know, to their home so that they could feed their older siblings who didn't have a chance to eat. So it was like, wow, we really saw the love of God in these little hearts. 
So that's what we do. We, you know, we, 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 we feed people. We make sure that there is some sort of food security in, in, in the people that we, look, we watch over. In some areas we build houses. I'll talk a bit more about that. We put kids back in school. Typically when there's war, an entire generation goes without education, which means when the country comes out of war, they have nothing to build upon. So that becomes very important, a little missing piece that we have to watch over. And then of course, you know, we create jobs and we do a lot of trauma work because many of them, you know, have seen their loved ones slaughtered. Um, we stand with them. We let them know they belong to a bigger family, that God sees their suffering and he cares for them. So it's kind of the work we do. Some of the, the places we go, though, are very dangerous. <laughs> but God becomes very real to us in those spaces. Back to the Congos, at one point in time, we were going into places that were eight hours deep into the jungle. So you're talking about... Um, the Congo, a lot of people don't know this, is actually um, a, a big war zone. The largest UN base is in the Congo. Yeah, and so um, it's a resource war, really. All of us have a piece of the Congo with us in our cell phones, in our laptops, you know, electric cars, if we drive those. Essentially, they, they, um, they found that you needed one sort of special metal, precious metal, um, in the periodic table called tantalum that is found in coltan ore. And this metal can, can conduct electricity at a frequency and intensity that no others can, right? And this um, coltan ore, 70% of it is found in the Congo. So it's a real resource war. Everyone wants a piece of that because that is powering our technologies, right? So there's a huge war there just in the Eastern Front where we work in. There are more than 170 different rebel armies controlling the jungles. So when we're going into the villages, we have to pray to God, God, when do I go in? When do I come out? Because depending on which rebel army controls which vicinity of the jungle, you will have checkpoints. And at that checkpoint, you know, you're going in, right? You're going in in your, 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 your jeep, you know, and, 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 and those checkpoints, they can stop you. They can look at you. They can look at your jeep. And they can think that your jeep is far more valuable than your life kill you in the middle of the jungle. There's no reception, nothing. No one will know where you've gone or what you've disappeared into. Take your Jeep and run away, right? So we really pray for favor with the people there. Um, and, and of course, when you're going into these areas, you know, you can have the roads can be flanked on both sides by elephant grass that's just taller than a person. So you never know who's lying in wait, waiting there to hijack or kidnap or whatever. You really don't know. You really need the protection of God. And of course, when we go in these areas, there are no roads. Uh, you know, it's only 2% of the Congo has paved roads. So it's all rocky, craggy, bombed out, sludgy roads that you're just like, you know, it's this very bone rattling ride. And after eight hours, you're like, come out of all tears everywhere. You know, you're just like knocked about. And, and the fastest you can go is maybe 10, 15 km per hour. So I always tell people, if I was riding on an elephant, I'll be much faster than our car right now. You know, so these are kind of like some of the journeys inland into these villages. Not, I shall not digress, but um, one time we were in the village that was eight hours deep into the jungle and we were ministering to a mama. Now, in those spaces, a lot of times the women, in order to put food on the table for their children, they end up prostituting themselves. Um, but to the villagers, like, that's the most horrible thing because you know, you're literally sleeping with the enemy. But to them, they're like, how, if I, I have nothing to give, I have, you know, so I give of myself to save my children's life. And so, so what we do when we're in this space is, yes, we help the community, but at the same time, we also re do a lot of reconciliation work, right? And so we were praying for this mama and we we're ministering to her. And when you're in those spaces, just by virtue of your skin color, you are a celebrity. Right now, because um, they want to know, they have never seen the white people, and I'm considered white. Me with my Hainanese steamed chicken skin is very white, <laughs> and so they want to know what are these white people are doing. You know, so they always gather around to see. So at any given time, wherever you go, whoever is free will follow you. So you can have like 40 to 50 people just surrounding you. So I'll show you the next picture. Thank you, Alvin. Um, so it's kind of like this. Whenever you're ministering, people will just surround you. Anyway, one day we were ministering and lots of people were surrounding and suddenly we hear in the midst of this a very loud, angry yelling in Swahili and we saw this rebel soldier charging down towards us, yelling, I'm going to take one of these missionaries and, and rape them tonight and no one can stop me. 
At that time, it was the first year I was in the Congo, my Swahili really wasn't very good. I only knew Hakuna Matata. And so, and so I didn't know what he was saying. And thankfully, I didn't know because I had no idea really what he was saying. But he just looked very angry and he was yelling, I will take these missionaries. And everyone was very scared. They, all the villagers just, just like backed away because this was, guy was dangerous. And I remember in that moment, my Congolese pastor, he's like our spiritual father. We say, if pastor says jump, we don't say why, we say how high, you know, we just listen to whatever pastor says, right? So he got filled with the spirit of God and he stepped in front of us missionaries and he looked at this charging soldier that was coming at us and he declared, I have a better idea. Why don't you kneel down? We'll pray for your soul. And suddenly this rebel soldier, zoop, drops to his knees <laughs> and now nobody is touching him sometimes people ask us have you seen angels yes we have seen angels do we always see them no but do we know that they're there oh yeah because nobody was touching this guy everyone was backed away but this guy was suddenly dropped to his knees and it was like he was pinned to the ground he was writhing and wriggling but he was stuck to the ground and when we realized that he was sufficiently apprehended we said okay now we pray for you <laughs> so we went up to him we prayed for him and after we finished our prayer it was like something demonic had left his eyes something left his eyes he just looked around like he was dazed like he didn't know where he was or what he was doing and he looked at my pastor and and the most bizarre thing happened he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a crumpled Congolese money note and he said pastor take this as my offering. <laughs> and we're like, wow. You know, sometimes you absolutely cannot manufacture these kind of miracles. You don't even know. First he wants to rape us, now he wants to give us an offering. You know, it's just like, oh. <laughs> and then, and my pastor took his offering and he said, we gave it to the mama that we're ministering to and then my pastor said, good. Now you go to church on Sunday. <laughs> and this guy was like a mouse. It's like he practically squeaked okay, you know, everyone was watching on in like, in like, just jaw drop amazement. And the most amazing thing happened. This soldier, he stumbled to his feet and he looked around at all the villagers and it was like the spirit of God took over his mouth and he said to them, listen to these people for they are the true servants of God. I tell you, there and then, people rushed forward. They're like, pray for me, pray for my son, pray for my goat. You know, they were like, pray for us. And in that moment, I realized that we, I, we, we could have preached, you know, until the cows come home, that God loves you, he's able, he's powerful, he can protect you, but it will mean nothing to them that have gone through all this kind of suffering and horror and trauma. But when God speaks for himself and he shows up, in power and he, he shows that he can take care of his own you know like you don't even have to say anything everybody was like what must we do to be saved and that's why i say you know we're not humanitarian workers we're not just there to to do good we are missionaries we're there to bring the presence and the power of god to transform lives so so key I remember the first time i came out of the congo and and you know a war zone and I was in a first world setting. I heard the most magical sound that I had ever heard in six months. And it was the sound of the flushing toilet. <laughs> I was talking to Pastor Peter and describing our, our pit latrines, you know, in Africa, if you want to buy a toilet, they say, ah, how deep? Five meters, 10 meters, and they dig the hole, and then it lasts you for 10 years, you know? And then Pastor Peter said, oh yeah, that was our toilets last time in Singapore. <laughs> but to me, it was like, wow. <laughs> um, but, you know, sound of flushing toilet, a hot shower, running water, running water. I remember when we were, when we were, first time I was in, in training, we, I had a friend who didn't shower for six weeks because we were in the, living in the middle of drought. So she didn't shower, she showered once in six weeks. I couldn't, I couldn't take it, I Singaporean. Uh, I showered once a week, you know, that was like the max I could do, you know, I was like, sorry, uh, after you shower, you apologize to everyone, sorry for taking the water because, you know, you were so miserable. <laughs> and, and I remember, you know, I came out of the, the, the toilet and I was in this first world place I, I got into my bed my spring mattress <laughs> and I put my fluffy duvet over me and I just cried I just wept and wept and wept because I couldn't reconcile it in my heart 
How is it that I could leave any time I wanted when the people I loved and served were stuck in this horror of war? And I couldn't reconcile it in my heart. I said, God, it's not fair. It's not fair. I mean, I, I said, we can't choose where we're born. I can't choose whether I'm born into, you know, privileged Singapore where, where everything works and I have all that I need or whether I'm born in the middle of the war zone and from the, the point of my first cry, I'm really fighting for my survival. We can't choose where we're born, you know, and I, I just, I was struggling so hard. And I've always thought, you know, that in Singapore, it was so blessed, it's like a divine conspiracy. Just yet last night, my, my little nephew, he was asking me, he said, he said, what, what happens if there's a tornado? And I said, oh, there's no tornado, baby. There's no tornado in Singapore. What about earthquakes? I said, there's no earthquakes in Singapore. You know, what the odds that we should belong to a country that is completely sheltered from natural disasters, that has political stability, that has economic stability, where we all grow up with an education, we have enough to survive. We are so blessed. And as cliche as it sounds, I really think that God has a destiny on our nations blessed to bless others. <clears throat> and we need to have the heart of the Father because we often call God our Father, but we don't see our brothers and sisters in the world suffering as our own and as belonging to us. Yeah, and, and I think God is really wanting to enlarge our hearts just like he did in my heart in that moment. Because when I was crying on that bed, he spoke to me and he said, Jem, you are your brother's keeper. And, and then he said, and to whom much is given, much is required. And it was like, in that moment, I signed on the dotted line with God. And I said, God, if this is the people that you're calling me to, then I will gladly give my life to them and to you and all your purposes that you have in store for them. Um, <clears throat> I remember telling my mom after this that I was really called to work and live in the Congo and and then after that, God moved me on to all these other spaces in East Africa. But, but when I told her that, you know, God is calling me to work and live in this war zone, we're having lunch together, me and my mom. And I remember a little tear trickled down her face. But she said something that, that changed my life and like that I've held fast to ever since. She said to me, you know, Jem, as far as your father and I are concerned, it is our pleasure to give God our best, even if it's one of our children. She said, but here's the truth. The truth is that at the end of your life, I cannot stand before God and answer for your life. Only you can answer for your own life. And you need to do everything that he puts on your heart. You need to go everywhere that he's leading you to. And with those words and with the blessing of my parents, I was launched into the great unknown. Today I have a message and it's called The Presence Driven Life. And I want to start with a question. If you were lost in a jungle, which would you prefer? A map or a guide? Okay, think about it, okay? Think about it. Let's take a little bit of an overview. If you were lost in a jungle, which would you prefer? A map or a guide? Okay, how many of you say you prefer to have a map? You can only choose one, okay? Who says a map? Okay, who says a guide? Wow, okay, almost everybody says a guide. Okay, well, why? Why would you prefer to have a guide? Why? Why? Why would you prefer a guide over a map? Anyone? <laughs> well, maybe, I think Pastor said here in the, uh, the morning service, she said, huh, what if I read the map wrong? <laughs> and then I end up in the wrong place, <laughs> right? Yeah, which is true, right? Maybe your guide has good map reading skills, or maybe your guide has a lot of experience. Maybe your guide has seen many across the finish line. He's brought many to the other side. He knows the lay of the land. He knows which pitfalls, where the, 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 the quicksand pits are, you know, how to na navigate the pitfalls and the dangers of the, of the area. He is well acquainted with the road ahead. Your guide has experience. Maybe your guide has skills. Maybe in the jungle, your guide knows how to hunt, or how to fish, you know, so that you don't go hungry in the middle of the jungle. Or maybe your guide knows which tree to hack away at so that you can get some fresh water to drink so that you don't go thirsty. Why else? Maybe your guide can give you companionship in the midst of that 
daunting space. Maybe your guide can comfort, can be a friend to your heart, so that it takes the edge off the journey and so that you can depend on someone and that you have the companionship of someone. Most of us say that we prefer a guide and yet in the jungles of life, we are constantly badgering God for the map when he's already given us the guide. The guide who is the Holy Spirit, who comforts us in uncertainty, who knows all that is to come, who is well-skilled for anything we face, a friend who will never leave us or forsake us. But we want the map so that we can do it all, get done with it. But in the process of everything, we do it in our own strength, we get burnt out and we say to God, God, I did all these things for you and you didn't bless me. And the Holy Spirit is just standing right next to us saying, well, I, I, I just, I wanted to help you. I wanted to be with you. God has been saying to me, Jem, I don't want you to do anything for me. Huh? I want to do everything with you. See, this life was not meant to be alone. I don't want you to do anything for me, God is saying to us. I want to do everything with you. He wants to do life together with us. You know, God has given us himself. The spirit of a person is like the, the heart of a person. Like God literally gave us his own spirit, his own heart. But sometimes instead of cultivating that relationship with the Spirit of God who is with us at all times and walking with us through all of life, we're so busy trying to do all these things and sometimes good intentions, we're trying to, so busy trying to do all these things to please Him when really He wants to empower us, He wants to be that companion, He wants us to be full of joy. You know, it's like He wants us to be sailboats with our sails bagging in the wind of his love and his approval and his empowerment and not rowboats trying to do it all in our own strength. Sometimes when I'm overwhelmed with grief, my guide comes to sit next to me and he says, let's have a cup of tea. Or when I'm stressed, he says, let's go for a walk. And suddenly the jungles of life don't seem so daunting anymore. The first year I was a missionary, I was in um, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh at that time. And my birthday had just passed. And I was feeling a bit forlorn, and so I threw myself a pity party. I said, oh God, where am I? Out nowhere. What am I doing with my life? I didn't know where I was going, who he was sending me to, what my what 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 he was, you know, what, what the road ahead looked like. I I said, God, I have nothing to show for my life. I began to think of all my friends that I graduated with, who had gone on into their, you know, many promotions, who had uh, married, who had, um, you know, are buying houses, and here I was in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> wondering what is going on with my life, you know. And it's so funny how God, when God speaks to you, He really like, He like cuts to the quick. And in that moment, while I was throwing my pity party, God said to me, Jem, whose kingdom are you building? You building your kingdom or my kingdom? He said, my kingdom is built in the hearts of people. And I'm sending you to them. It's largely unseen, but deeply felt. Then he said something interesting. He said, you may not have the answers when people ask you what your five to ten year plan is. And he was right. Because in that first year of being a missionary, I had no answers. People were wondering, hey, what's she doing? Huh? What's she doing? And even people who love me would be like, I don't know whether this is just a passing phase. Huh? Let her go out, like, go out into the world, explore a bit. Huh? You know, or people thought maybe you know, I had some sort of superhero complex. And you know, dun, dun, we need to save the world. You know? So they were all wondering, what is she up to? You know, I had people say, I think she's throwing her life away. You know, she had all these other opportunities that she could be involved in. What is she doing out there? Huh? How can this last? How is she going to sustain herself? Where is she going to get income? How is she going to help the people out there? You know, people had all these questions and I had no answers. I had no answers. You know, especially when you're, when you're a missionary, you're really following the spirit. You know, you, you don't even have any fruits to show because you're growing roots before fruits, right? I had nothing to show. I didn't know what to say. I, I also didn't know where I was supposed to go, you know, so it was, I was in this, like, living in the midst of mystery. 
And God said, you may not have the answers when people ask you what your five to ten year plan is, but one thing they will not be able to deny is that my presence will be upon your life and that will be answer enough. Huh. When he told me this, it reminded me of a story in the Bible in Exodus 33. Now, in Exodus 33, um, there is an account of a story, uh, a conversation between God and Moses. Okay, this is my paraphrase. Essentially, what happened is the children of Israel had built a golden calf, had worshipped it, and you know, God saw it, his heart was anguished, you know, and he was betrayed and he was in pain and, and he confided with his friend Moses and he said, Moses, this is what's going to happen. This is the plan. I am going to send an angel before you and the people of Israel. This angel will lead you to the promised land. It will help you vanquish all your foes, but I am not going with you because these people, they are stubborn and stiff-necked people and if I go with them, I might burn them up along the way. Okay, my paraphrase. Now, what did Moses, the friend of God, say in response to this? <clears throat> verse 15, 33, verse 15, Exodus 32, verse 15. He said to God, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct, I and your people? distinct from every other people on the face of the earth. Moses essentially said to God, God, what's the point? What's the point of getting to the promised land if your presence is not with us? If your presence does not go with us, don't send us from here. Wow. When I hear this story, you know what strikes me? Is that we can make it to the promised land of our lives without God, without his presence. And that is sobering. You see, you know, we always talk about the purpose-driven life, and I think a purpose-driven life is great, but I think there is something better, and I think that is a presence-driven life. See, purpose is important, but it's a natural byproduct of his presence. When you walk with your maker, the very one who designed you and who knows the good plans he has in store for you, you will naturally fulfill every purpose you, have, you were designed for. Moses, the friend of God, knew how to cherish his presence. The same first year I was, I was a missionary, someone came and prophesied over me, and, she's, and he said, you know, your life is the John 3, 8 life. And I said, the John 3, 8 life? And I went to look, and John 3, 8 says, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. And such will be the life of the believer in the spirit. And I'm like, huh? Don't know where it's coming from. Don't know where it's going. Ayo. Huh. <laughs> and the truth is, to this day, 10 years on, I can tell you, I still don't know where I'm going <laughs> or what I'm about to do. But I know how to follow. I know how to be a sheep. I've learned how to remain in his presence and watch as things unfold. And that's how Jesus lived too. He said that he sees what the Father is doing and he follows after. He was always watching. He was fettered to the Holy Spirit and fettered in communion with God to follow after. <clears throat> i tell you a story. Um, I'll show you the next picture. This story takes place in a forgotten refugee camp in the middle of the Kenyan desert. And I came upon this refugee camp about a good six, seven years ago. And I went there with my local pastor who I met in missionary training school. We uh, trained under Heidi Baker in Mozambique. And, um, and so he was working amongst these refugees and God told me one day to go and help him. And when I went and on, on site into this refugee camp, I saw, I just witnessed such abject poverty. You know, when you're living in a desert, um, there's no cloud cover, so, so the temperatures can go as high as 35 to 40 degrees in the day, the midday, and as low as under 10 degrees at night, so all in one day, so incredible weathering. And when I went into these tents, I saw that people were sleeping on rice sacks and newspapers without even blankets to cover themselves. And the children, again, were wasting away. Many of them had watched their children die in front of their eyes because there was no water, no food. It was such a desperate situation and that was all they had, you know? And so, 
when I went into this space with, with my pastor, his name is Isaac, you know, I, I, I told Isaac, I said, you know, let's try to feed as many families as we could. So we gathered about 42 vulnerable families and we started feeding these families and we thought that was very good. <laughs> Today, we are feeding 1,200 families, but only because there has been a three-year-long drought in this area and, um, and, and just more and more became hungry. Um, but we started with 42 families and, and then we went on from there. We started putting kids in school. And at that time, I'm thinking, I'm just a young missionary. You know, I'm looking into my bank account and I'm thinking like, oh, what can I do for these people? You know, what do I have to give to them? I was breaking my own bread, you know, desperately to try to feed um, these people that God had brought me to. And I thought, you know, I'm just, I'm just a young missionary, you know, like, what can I do? I'm just one person. And so I thought that was all. That was all I could do until one day. What happened was the govern government began to try to settle these families. And so what they did was they gave them these tin roofs, metal roofs, and these simple wooden poles. And so what the families did was they tried to take their tattered tops from these tents and they would just try to, you know, wrap it around these, these poles to make walls, you know. So I'll show you the next picture. This picture I'm about to show you is considered a very good house because they had enough materials to try to wrap around the entire structure that they were given. Most of our families were only able to wrap around one quarter of the shelter that they were given. And so I was you know, invited to go into um, the shelter, a very tattered shelter like this of one family. So my pastor and I, Isaac, we, we went into this tattered shelter and we saw that it was completely bare inside. Bare bare mud floors. They only had one like very roughly fashioned um, bench that they had me and my pastor sit as a place of honour while everyone else just kind of like sat on the, like, the dirt floor. And in that space, um, it was actually a pastor and his six children. A pastor, his a wife, and his six children that were refugees. And this pastor father, he began to share his story. And he said, you know, back in the day, I had my own farm. I even had a tractor to my name. But when war broke out, everything was burnt. I lost everything. I grabbed all my children, and we ran for our lives. At that time, I had eight children. But just in the process, he described the process of running from place to place in the jungles, and he lost two children in front of his eyes. One died from malnutrition, and the other died from a sickness, and they just couldn't access any help, and he just had to bury his two children and move on. And while this pastor is like telling his story, he kept, he kept like wiping something off his lips. And when I looked at his thumb, I saw it was full of blood. And we later found out that it wasn't scurvy. It was just that this, this father was so stressed that the finer capillaries on his lips were bursting. There was just blood. He was so afraid that he would continue to watch his children die in front of his eyes. And so he was just consumed with this terror. When I came out of that tent and that shelter with my pastor, you know, I said, I, I said, oh, let's, um, let's put them on the feeding program. Um, let's put the kids in school. Let's just do our best to try to, to help them as well. I thought I was, I saw their suffering. I thought I saw, I thought I saw. I thought I was doing all I could. But as I went from camp to, uh, from tent to tent in the, in the camp, just working, I began to itch. <clears throat> I was itching, I was itching. That's itching, that's itching, and I'm thinking, what's going on? And as soon as I got back, I realized I had been bitten down both legs with more than 100 flea bites down both legs. I was like a spotted leopard. And I was like, oh, what's this? And I realized that in sitting in that tent with that family, I was getting eaten alive by fleas. Ah, it was so excruciating. When the locals saw it, they said, oh, Jem, don't count it. Don't count it or they'll multiply. And I said, what? What kind of fable is this? I'll count it. So I counted more than 100 down both legs. I was like, oh, it was terrible. No amount of solve could like, you know, get rid of the itchiness. It was so bad. I tried to Google, you know, what to do with flea bites. And Google said that flea bites can drive you to insanity. I'm like, ah, oh, it was terrible. You know, if you ever get unbitten by fleas, it's like much more itchy than a mosquito bite. And I had more than 100 bites. I was, oh, in such excruciation. I could not sleep every night. I'd just be itching, itching, itching like a little monkey. On the fifth night, <clears throat> I was in bed. I pulled my blanket over myself, and when you're in that liminal space, you suddenly feel every sensation, and I was like itching again, and I was like, ah, I hadn't slept for five nights straight. I threw off my blanket, and I complained to God, and I said, Jesus, I thought you said you were interceding for me. You forgot about the fleas. 
<laughs> and in that moment, I could hear almost like Jesus chuckling. And then he said one word. He said, Jem, identification. And suddenly it hit me. You know how God can speak into your heart and suddenly you understand the revelation that he's given to you in that moment? It hit me that I did not have my entire house burned to the ground. I did not run for my life. I did not see loved ones die in front of my eyes. I have not gone through crazy hunger and starvation and I'm fighting for my survival. I'm not sleeping out there in the cold. All I was experiencing was a very tiny fraction of what they were going through. I was getting bitten by fleas and I could leave that place and they could not. That was all they had for a house. And my eyes were open. I think this is what Jesus did when he left the glories of heaven to come and live with us on this dusty dirt ball. <laughs> he came to walk in the dust of the earth. He came to experience every suffering known to men. And we have to ask why? Why did he do that? You know, Why did he subject himself to that? I believe it's because he didn't just want to be with us physically. He wanted to be with us on a heart level to be able to relate to us in our pain and our suffering, to be that great high priest for us. He identified with us. So I went back into this tattered shelter and with my pastor and I, I, I said to the family, I said, what do you want? What do you need? How can we help you? Husband and wife looked at each other like, like, where do we begin, <laughs> you know? And so I asked the little children and the oldest daughter, she was about 14 years old, she said, we need, we need blankets because we're so cold at night. Her little brother who was 10 years old said, can we have walls? We need walls because the wind blows through our, tart, our tattered tops and we're so cold at night. And then in that moment, I felt God say, build them a house. That was the first house we built in this refugee camp. And um, I'll show you the next picture. Um, this is the family. Of course, we also gave them clothes because they really had no clothes and they were so cold. Clothes and jackets. And this is like them standing in front of their house for a little photo shoot, you know, with um, their Sunday best. And you can see the neighbors peering into the windows of the house we just built. We built them a very simple house uh, made of good quality material. You know, we partitioned it so that they had a little living room and two bedrooms to the side. And we had a gutter system that, that is able to collect the rainfall from the roof into a big tank that can last them three months for essential use, you know, so we built a first prototype of our house. At that time, I thought, okay, you know, stop for the one, you know, that was my assignment, built one house, you know, I, that's all I had in my account, let's just build the house. But my guide, he was moving on, he had greater plans, he was leading us even deeper. The Holy Spirit began to impress my heart to, you know, share this story, share this story with friends, family. And so I shared it with loved ones and, and families would say, well, I can build one house as well. Another family said, well, I can build five houses. And next thing you know, we could build the next 10 houses. And I told my pastor and he, he saw the email. He jumped up and he ran to the refugee camps and he told the village chief and they hugged each other and they went to find, you know, the poorest families that were really struggling, grandmothers with grandchildren, entire middle generation killed in war or single mothers that had no way to shelter themselves and we began to start with these families built 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 to this day we have built over 350 houses in this refugee camp <clears throat> and that is just the miracle of god you know how the kingdom comes as a seed but eventually becomes a big tree that shelters many many lives Bible says, you know, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Sometimes in life we have light for the whole path, but many times we find ourselves in seasons where we only have light enough for the next step, light for the feet, you know. But God promises that we are children of light. We will always have light for the next step. And some of us may be seated here and you may find yourself in a season of great uncertainty. But I want to encourage your heart to say that when it's this step-by-step -step process with God, what builds is our dependence on him. We grow closer in that place of dependency. You see, in the world, maturity is independence. But in the upside-down kingdom, maturity is marked by dependence.
dependency on God, oneness with God, walking one with God. Sometimes, I think the main reason got me, God brought me out into the fields, you know, where everything is an unknown, you know, I don't know where to go, you know, I don't know who to trust, I can't even speak the language except for Hakuna Matara, you know, that in those spaces, what actually happens is that I learn to lean on him more, you know, and I experience an infinitely deep measure of his love in every regard. There's very little that I can drag along with me, my 23 kg luggage, you know, across the border into, into these spaces, right? And that's where I have to draw from God my comfort, my affirmation, my, you know, he gives me his attention, his approval, his affection, and these become my life source, you know, where all the world's distractions were stripped away. God became my exceedingly great reward. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is in the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5. And it says, Who is this coming out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? It became a very blessed journey that I went on, went on with God. I don't want you to do anything for me. I want to do everything with you. God wants to walk with us profoundly in this life. Sometimes it takes us slowing down, surrendering control, and asking him to open our eyes to his masterful orchestration all around us. The Bible says that God delights in ordering our steps, right? Sometimes in Singapore, we're so self-sufficient that we're autopilot all the way, you know, with our lives, with our days, that we forget that we have a guide that longs to lead us and guide us into special spaces, that longs to, to make fruitful our lives. And when we practice following him, he leads us to some of the most unexpected hearts. I'm going to end with one story. Um, this was before I became a missionary. Um, I was really at that time practicing, you know. Um, you know, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit, so I want to host the Spirit of God well in my heart. I want the Spirit of God to dwell with me. I want to be able to attune, you know, to what he's saying. I want to, to be able to really train my senses to know what the Holy Spirit is doing around me so that I can follow after, right? So this was my little training program with, with God. And, and so I was in this kind of space and one morning I was going out for a run it was like early morning, it was 6, 7 a.m. in the morning and I was tying my shoelaces when I heard the Holy Spirit say to me I want you to go and talk to your security guard and so I said, oh, okay and so usually I go, go out the back door but this time around I went out the front door and so I went up to my security guard and there's like a little guard house and there's a little cubby hole you know that I usually talk to her from and I generally have a very good relationship with her you know whenever I come back I will just check in you know talk to her make small talk and ask her how she's doing sometimes I buy her a bun now and then so we were on fairly good terms but I knew that the security guard was very much of another faith and she felt a very devotee of another faith. And so, so, you know, we respect that difference and I just showed her love and just befriended her. Anyway, that morning I went up to her and I said, hi, auntie. And she said, hey, go, going running. Ah. I said, yeah, 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 going running. Ah. Wow, you're very good. Ah. Exercising early in the morning. Haha, <laughs> no, la, auntie, how are you? And so small talk, right? How are you, auntie? Do you have a good night's rest? Yeah, 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 good, not bad. Eh, eh, eh. No, no, I didn't, I didn't sleep well last night. Huh, what happened? I asked her. And she was like, ah, yeah, you know, uh, sometimes uh, you have these funny dreams. La. Then uh, you find it very hard to sleep after that. And I said, oh, dreams? I'm thinking, okay, Holy Spirit has sent me to her, so maybe it has to do with this dream. So I said, ah, what do you dream about? Ah, yeah, don't tell you, la, girl. Ah, yeah, don't waste your time. It's very funny on these dreams. I said, no, auntie, sometimes dreams are symbolic. You know, you can tell me. I can interpret dreams. Huh? You can, ah. I said, yeah. <laughs> Holy Spirit, come in, come in. Do you copy? <laughs> I need you now. <laughs> and she, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then she said, ah, yeah, don't tell you, la. It's very funny. I said, no, auntie, just tell me. Maybe it means something. Okay, la. I tell you, but you don't laugh, okay? I said, yeah, I won't laugh. And she said, okay. I dreamt last night that I was in World War III and I got shot and I died. And I was like, oh, oh dear God, <laughs> how do I interpret this dream? And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> and she said, yeah. But she said, I think I saw Jesus. Oh, and two angels, two, two angels. They're not very big, but two angels. 
And they came, and it's like they carried me, but it's not my body. Like my body was still on the ground, but it's like they carried like, like my spirit or my soul or something. I said, uh huh. And she's like, and we went higher, higher, and I could see the earth getting smaller and smaller. And then I went into this place. Maybe it's heaven. I don't know what it was, lah.、Huh? But then I saw a baby's cot. And the angels were going to put me in the cot, and I said, "No, no, no! I'm too fat. I'm too big. I cannot fit in the cot." But boom, I'm there in the cot, and it was perfect fit for me. What is the meaning of my dream? <laughs> I was like, ah, ah, and in that moment, I could have gone like,、mm, yes,、um, this dream, the baby's cot, is symbolic of. But I was like, no, 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 Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to this heart over here? And so I just went out on a limb. I didn't even know what I was saying, but I was just, you know, word of knowledge. I went into it, and I said, "I said,、um, Auntie, I'm just getting the sense that God gave you this dream because He knows that you did not have a good childhood." I said, "In fact, I'm getting the sense that your childhood was very violent, and that there was no love, and you never understood what it felt like to be loved as a child." This auntie looks at me, stricken, and she went. And she just began to cry and weep, <laughs> and then and I'm just like, okay. I mean, I know I'm on the right track here now. <laughs> so I just went deeper. Holy Spirit, I said, in fact, I kind of sense that you know you have gone through so much misery in life that you even tried to kill yourself three times. You know, <laughs> sometimes in those moments you can be quite bold and specific. And I'm just really telling what the Holy Spirit is telling me in that moment. And but God always stopped you, and He never let you go because He wants you to know that He loves you. And and this auntie is just like. <laughs> She's just like crying because suddenly, right in front of her, her whole life was spelled out before her. She said, "Come in, girl, come in." I'm like,、oh, "Okay." So you know, I go around to the 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 the, the little guard house and and bear in mind, ah,、uh, this auntie still has to do her job. You know, she's still pressing the button. You know, to open and close the gantry. You know, and I'm down there squatting down at her at her swivel chair. You know, trying to make sure that I stay out of the way. If not, they will say, "Who is this crazy girl?" You know, stopping our poor security guard from doing her job. And so, <laughs> so I was trying not to be seen. She's Crying, she's opening, closing her gantry, and she's telling me her life story, how bad it was, how、um, her mother died when she was very young, the the father remarried, the stepmother never loved her, the father eventually died, the stepmother became abusive after that, even took a hammer to her head.、Um, To the point where she had to run away from home, and eventually she got married, and and then found out that the husband was also abusive, and her life was just no love, and she had tried and tried and tried to take her life. She never understood what it felt like to be loved. She's telling me all of this, and I hear the Holy Spirit say, "I want you to ask her if she will allow me into her heart." And I'm like, oh, but this auntie is a real devotee of some something else, you know. And but I just asked, I asked, and the auntie said, yes, yes, yes. I was like, really? Okay, you know. And so, opening close the gantry, crying, she's repeating after me, saying the sinner's prayer. This auntie comes to God into the kingdom. At the end of it, I'm like so relieved, you know. I sit down on the floor, and then she leans back in her chair. And she begins to muse, and then she tells me that she said, "You know, Jam, I'll tell you something. You will not believe it. Two weeks ago, a very famous astrologer came, and I queued up for hours just to have my fortunes read. When I was finally face to face with him, he looked at me, and he said, 'I don't know how to tell you this because we're from a different faith, but you will find joy with the Christian gods.'" And because of that, when I came and asked her, "Would you like to invite Christ into your heart?" she said, "Yes." The Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of love, is moving throughout the earth, reconciling men to God. He knows where the lost sheep are. He hears the cries of the broken, the hungry, the destitute, and he is looking for willing vessels. He longs to partner with us. We. Are the doorways where heaven meets the earth, and we have to know that, and we have to be sober-minded about that. We are the very hands and feet of Jesus on the face of this earth. Pastor Glenn told me that your your theme for the year is loving people intentionally. Wow! If we could ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, who do you want me to avail my heart to that they might experience your love? 
and just really slow down and watch where he's going and follow after. See, God welcomes dependency. He likes us to lean in on him. In our weakness, he is strong, right? The wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon, prayed this prayer. He said, God, I'm like a little child. I don't know how to go out or how to come in. The Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize that they need God. Why? Because to them belong the kingdom of heaven. Who else does the Bible say the kingdom of heaven belongs to? Who else? Very good. The children. The children who are dependent on their father to provide, to lead, to guide, to instruct. God welcomes us to be dependent on him, to walk with our guide in life. We don't need to know everything or to feel qualified to make a difference. We just have to be children dependent on our loving father. And if we walk with our maker, the very one who designed us, we will never miss our purpose. So I sense today that there is a commissioning in the spirit to step out in faith with what God has put on our hearts and trust him each step of the way. I want to demystify missions as you know, a calling for the daring, the courageous, the brave, or the skilled. I think God is just looking for hearts willing to walk with him. I remember when I first became a missionary, um, Heidi Baker, I don't know if you've heard of Heidi Baker, you know, she's a missionary as well. Um, she prophesied over me and, and it was at an altar call and she knelt down beside me and she said, you are asking God, what can you do with my little life? And she laughed. <laughs> I was there too. She said, God can do a lot with a willing heart. And we never know how many lives lie at the other end of our simple yes to God. We just never know. And so I think God is just looking for willing hearts to love beyond ourselves, to see and identify with the suffering and as a community, bend to serve. So I'm going to end my sermon here. Um, God is here and his invitation stands. Will you come away with me?